Joshua chapter 4. I've always wondered when my voice would break. My high school had its 20th anniversary, 20th reunion Friday night at a bar in Sherwood. I didn't go. But uh, apparently that's how long it was taking me is to, to get this low. Uh, I had a friend who was a base in high school. Now I have taken on the I no longer, I'm no longer fit as a fiddle, I'm more fit like a string bass, and now I'm selling one. But, uh, of course, you never know how you actually sound, you just know what you think you sound like. And I don't know, I may sound perfectly reasonable to you all, but in my ears, something's just not right. Uh, <clears throat> but that's why my question is, I don't think my voice will hold up for that. Same with why I didn't sing very much. I like to get in a good monkey sound as much as the next guy and who we're the king of the jungle. But I, I didn't know if I'd be able to uh, preach as well as sing. So we're going to fight the fight and ask taking questions for a couple of weeks. So save those up, write them down, email them in, whatever you want to do so that I can be aware of them. Um, but tonight we're just going to look at Joshua 4. Now Joshua 3, you may recall from last week, they crossed the river. So they didn't actually cross the river. The river got out of the way because the, the priest went in with the ark, and as their feet hit the water, got piled up the waters of the river Jordan upstream so that they were able to cross as if they were on dry land. There's a couple of miraculous aspects of this. First of all, is the fact that God stops the waters flowing in the first place. And second is that even with the water just only recently have stopped, they were able to cross it. I don't know if you've ever tried to cross a, a stream, maybe gone out in the woods, um, whether you were hunting or golfing, either either one takes me into the woods. I know we've got some golfers here. Um, and I, I, and even as a Boy Scout, camping, backpacking out through the woods, and, and there'd be places you could tell there had been a seasonal stream, and it had rained the day before, the water wasn't flowing, but it still, you stepped in its spot, you just kind of sunk up to your ankles. And it was hard to walk through, but that didn't affect the people of Israel. As God brought them into the promised land, they were able to cross the river without a problem. They bring everybody across except for the women, children, and older folks of uh, the uh, tribe of, of uh, Gilead, or not Gilead, they live in Gilead, Reuben, and the half tribe of Manasseh and Gad stayed on the other side. But their warriors went over to help take the promised land. And once they've done this, God says to Joshua, he says, take and send, we'll, we'll get this directly from the text. Uh, verse 2, take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command him, saying, take up for yourselves 12 stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you, and lay them down in the lodging place where you were lost tonight. So Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross again the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan. And each of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. <clears throat> Let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, What do these stones mean to you? You shall say to them, Because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. God says, Send twelve guys back, pick up a rock. Now, because he says, put it up on your shoulder, we've got to assume, I think it's a safe assumption from Scripture, that it wasn't a small rock. Okay? They didn't go get a dozen little river pebbles. They didn't even go get a dozen, you know, good slingshot rocks like David picks up when he fights Goliath. I think it's a safe assumption to say these guys got down into the riverbed and got themselves a rock. Okay? Because they had to put it up on their shoulder even though that's not the best way to lift heavy things because you tear your rotator cuff. <laughs> but they got it up and carried it out. And then they set up this monument of these 12 stones. And in about seven weeks, we're going to revisit this monument when, when it's homecoming because we're going to talk about something that, that happens related to this monument. We'll talk about it later. Uh, but this is where it gets set up to start with. And they built this out of these 12 stones, one for each tribe. And they take them from where the priests are standing. And God says, this is so that your children will ask you, what's the purpose of these rocks? And you can tell them what God has done. And then after they've done that, then the priests come out of the river, and the river starts back up. 
and the people of Israel have all crossed over to the other side. And so what we want to do is, what's the purpose of this? A couple of things that I think are worth noting. Number one, God does not expect that you will be able to remember everything that happens without a little bit of help. Some of you think that it's a bad thing that you have to write stuff down. It's not. God didn't. God, God expected the people of Israel to have to use a rock to remember stuff, okay? A pen and a post-it note is not a bad thing. <laughs> Gather reminders of the stuff that God has done in your life. I would encourage you to do this on a regular basis. A couple of things to do about it. Number one, when God does big and amazing things in your life that you just go, wow, that was special, make a note of it someplace. Have a spot that you keep that. The other thing is this. Do something that drives you to every day write down something that you've seen that God has done. I actually have a, a little journal, with, and I should have brought it, but it stays on my nightstand so that I don't forget it. And it's only about that big. It's probably three and a half by five. It has 366 pages in it. Actually, a little bit more. It has a page for every day, and each, each day has got about four or five lines for it for every day. But it's a five-year journal where every day at the end of the day I write down something from that day. <coughs> and then when I get done with those five years, I will have a five-year recollection of something that I saw God do every day of my life across those five years. Train yourselves to look for the remarkable little things that God does alongside the great big things he does. Because the God that can be trusted with little stuff is the God that we trust with the big things. When we have those giant crisis moments of our lives, you know, when the people of Israel were struggling with something and they're standing there by the Jordan River and they're going, you know, 20 years later, they're thinking, I just don't know if this is going to work. You know, this is... I, it, is God even real? They can look, and there's this pile of rocks. Well, God, God did bring us across the river. I have this reminder. And so, and, and in the little things, make note of that. Not only of what God teaches you as you read His Word, but of the things that He does. And even if it is so simple as I got through the day and I was able to breathe, and until you've had a health problem, that denies you that ability, you may not realize how great of a blessing that that is. But take it from a guy who is not yet 40, and yet who has been to the emergency room more than twice because I didn't have that ability. And because when they put the little pulse ox meter on me, they looked at me and they looked at the numbers and they were surprised that I was actually even functional. It's something to be grateful for. <laughs> Make a note of it every day. Force yourself to finish your day, not checking your Facebook. Move Facebook back five minutes. Not checking the sports scores, although whether or not the Braves win is important. <laughs> not checking your stock market quotes. Make it a point that in the last few moments of the day, you tell the most important person in your life that you love them. That means you got to send a text message to your mama, hope she's got a phone on silent. Tell your husband, your wife, your kids, jot down a little note, and then force yourself to look back across the day and find one thing God has done for you in that day, and go to bed grateful. Let gratitude for that be the way you finish your night. You will learn to sleep better. And you will learn to wake up better. Because a lot of times, the last stuff on our mind when we go to bed at night usually becomes some of the first things that cross our mind when we get up in the morning. And that's not at all in the sermon notes that I was going to say that. That just kind of crossed my mind. We need to hit that. Go to bed grateful to God for His grace. You wake up more likely a little more grateful for His grace. But gather those reminders. I still have a hat that I got that was given to me as a gift when I went on a mission trip in 1994. I can't, it doesn't fit, it didn't fit when they gave it to me. Okay? 
because this doesn't take an extra large. It takes a double X <laughs> because it's very thick. It's incredibly thick. Okay, um, and that's that's the truth. It takes it takes a lot. I have a couple of hats that actually we actually use for home decor because I can't wear them anyway. They're not quite small enough for Stephen yet, but he'll grow into them and he can have them. But I keep that. It's a reminder of some of the things that God has done. I have other things that I keep. I still have a T-shirt from I, or the hats from '95, the T-shirts from '94. Those some things that God has done in my life. Uh, last week, y'all saw me and on Sunday morning. I was still I was wearing a name tag so that y'all knew who I was. <laughs> I was hoping that you know you would introduce yourselves and get to me because since I was wearing a name tag, uh, it would help me learn house names. It didn't. But I also have another batch of name tags from every time I took a youth group to camp from a bunch of other things that I did and was a part of that remind me of things that God brought me through. Didn't cost any extra money. They're only slightly inconvenient to move. They're hanging up on the wall in my office. The clock on the wall in my office is a reminder of the three years that God put me in GPS, working with people, trying to help keep my own sanity while also helping draw other people to Christ through what I did. It's a reminder that God's grace was there for me even on the days that I failed in the big brown machine and on the days that I did well. And it's a reminder to me to pray for some of those people that, that I knew. It's up there on my wall reminds me of that. There's a picture up on my wall that reminds me of this elderly couple that when I was in seminary the first time, and that's another story for another day, how many attempts that took the first time, and we were trying really hard to figure out where we were going to get this stuff called food because our budget was very, very tight. Um, and it was working at a fast food restaurant. Things were tight. And they advertised they needed somebody who had ever used a Macintosh computer to help this older couple. And by older, I mean they were in the 80-plus bracket who had never used a computer before. They'd gone down to the Apple store and bought themselves a Mac. And they were from up in the Northeast, and they were wanting to use a computer to stay in touch with their old friends and family. And they were... They found out what the app store was going to charge them for, for lessons. And they were friends and supporters of the seminary. So they called student services and said, if you can find us a seminary student who can teach us how to use this Mac, we'll pay him what the app store was going to charge us. That bought food because the app store was expensive. And I was the only guy out of 250 seminary students who back 10 years almost before I was in seminary was a part-time youth intern at a church in North Little Rock that used Macs instead of normal computers that everybody else knew how to use. And so I had to learn how to use a Mac in the summer. But out of 250 plus seminary students, I was the only guy who even said, oh yeah, I've touched one of those before. Because God worked that circumstance together to provide it. Not only that, but it's a really beautiful picture because it's a picture of Jesus after the resurrection and his commission to Peter as he tells him, feed my sheep. And it's just, it's a reminder that that's what I'm supposed to do. And that that was part of their investment in my life was that God put them there to enable me to learn what I was supposed to do to feed his sheep. It's a very meaningful thing to me. And a very good reminder of how God works and how God had worked. Gather those reminders in your life. All the things that we hold on to, all the trophies, all the trinkets, and yet we forget what God has done for us. And we ought not do that. Gather those reminders like the people of Israel did. Gather those things that will help you remember and make an effort to look for them. Now alongside that, you may have to go back into something that you didn't necessarily want to be in in the first place, just so that you could gather them up. Can you kind of picture the 12 guys? Hey, go back in the river, though. What if the water starts back? No, go back and get her. It'll be okay. Sometimes it takes that extra measure of faith and commitment to experience that and to gather that. Sometimes you have to stand there and hold on to something 
long enough to give people that opportunity. The priests were standing there in the middle of the river holding the ark, and I'm thinking that they're probably starting a little tired because that's not a light box, okay? Because the thing is solid wood layered inside and out with gold, and what's in it? A jar of manna, which was not light, a stick, and two big pieces of rock with the Ten Commandments on it. Not a light box. We're not talking cardboard here, folks. Sometimes one of the things that you need to do is to help hold, hold on to something long enough to help other people be reminded this is how God worked. The next thing you see is this. They're told to do this so that their children will say, what are these stones about?
rose up from the grave on the third day and saved us from all eternity in hell and the wrath of God, then your life is missing something. Because there ought to be things in your life. There ought to be things like that. There ought to be habits of that. We can say, well, I exercise because the doctor told me to. Well, I eat healthy because I know I'm supposed to. Well, I watch this show because that's what everybody watches. I do this because my work requires it. I dress like this because, well, it's hot and I want to be cool. Well, it's cold and I want to be hot. I dress like this because it's cheap or because it's fancy. I drive this, I do this because of all these reasons. There ought to be things in our life that the only explanation for it is that we are the redeemed people of God. And if there's not anything in your life that the only explanation for why you do it and how you do it is because the Lord God has saved you, you have left things out of your life. Now, it ought to be that everything that we do has a component and a portion of it that reminds us and helps us tell other people about Jesus. And there's not a specifically Christian way to cook macaroni and cheese. <laughs> there are better ways and worse ways. But there's not a specifically Christian way to cook macaroni and cheese. But there's certainly a specifically believing way to approach being grateful to God for the fact that you got to eat it. Because it's a glorious gift from above. God loves us and wants us to have a full and blessed life. And so he gives us things like macaroni and cheese and bacon. <laughs> I can't get an amen on that. <laughs> There's not a specifically Christian way to do that. But there are God-honoring ways to go to work tomorrow. There are God-honoring ways to carry yourself throughout the day. There are God-honoring ways to be a husband, a wife, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a student. A homeschool student, a homeschool teacher, parents that homeschool your kids. There's a God honoring way to do that. There's a way to do that that draws attention to yourself instead of to him. There's a God honoring way to be a public school student, a private school student, a college student. There's a God honoring way to retire, and there's a self absorbed way to retire. All you retired people need to think about that. All you that plan on retiring anytime soon need to think about that. There's a way to do it that points people to Jesus, and there's a way to do it that points people to, hey, I made good investment choices. One is what we ought to be about. If you were blessed to make good investment choices too, then so be it, but give credit where it's due. There are ways that we can approach our life that causes people to ask us questions, and they say, why do you do this? Why do you stop, take the time to pray before you eat? After all, mom's a good cook. Why do you have to pray over the food? <laughs> because grateful to God who provided it. What do you mean the God who provided it? Did you work to earn the money for this? I did. I had the ability to go to go work because God gave it to me. Why do you do that? Why do you take time out of your day to read the Bible? Why do you stop and ask the checker at Walmart how you can pray for her? Why would you do that? No other explanation for a lot of it but that. <clears throat> we are the redeemed people of God and we want to carry that light to those around us. Just as when you look at the people of Israel, they were told to do this, and you see this a couple other times. They put up big rocks to remind them. This is what God has done. So where are the rocks in your life? Now I'm not saying that you've got to go home and build a, a rock garden. Okay? I mean, it beats having yards you got to mow. <laughs> but gather some things that remind you. Start jotting down a little bit. One line a day. This is what God's done for me today. Take the time every day to look at something in Scripture that reminds you to be thankful and to see God at work in your life around you. And you will be amazed at how quickly you go from, I don't know if I can come up with one line a day. I don't know if I can limit myself to one line a day. I can't spend five minutes on that. It takes 15. It takes 20. I've had to give up watching Dancing with the Stars. It take too long to be thankful. Trust me, you're better off. Dancing <laughs> with the stars won't drive you to lust, but it will drive you to break an ankle. Okay, don't, don't go there. 
stuff dangerous. You're not that flexible, okay? Take the time. Start to see how God begins to change your perspective on the world around you. Because it's not just a pile of rocks. It's seeing what the Rock of Ages has done in us. You pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you that you bring us this far. We ask the Lord God to go with us as we go from this place. Help us to carry your love and your truth to all we come in contact with. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.